welcome once again to our evening fellowship. As time goes by, we'll be learning both the uh, teaching methodologies and also learning the Bible doctrine. So let's switch a little bit to the Bible doctrine. We'll be the first thing we want to look at today is what is the Bible. Then later, what is the Bible? We cannot finish today. We'll uh, look at a few things because there are some areas that I would like us to have an in-depth. Some areas we'll just need to mention. So the areas that we need to have an in-depth, we'll not touch on them today. We'll touch on them in the next session when we sit together again. So we need to understand the Bible. This is a question that, that most people cannot answer. What is the Bible? We just ask people, most people will not answer. They'll tell you something. If you ask him to elaborate further, he'll not tell you. But we want to establish ourselves in a way that we are able to understand what the Bible and how it came about and uh, how do we relate to the Bible. Then we learn about God, who is God. This corona period has revealed to me that many believers don't know who God is because I've shuffled through the Facebook uh, live uh, preachings and you hear the kind of things that people are speaking about. You just know people don't have an idea who God is. I've listened to their teachings about Corona and how it came about and what the will of God. It just pieces you off. You're like, come on. So we'll take our time and understand who God is, uh, his character and everything. Then we will uh, uh, take time and uh, completely understand the doctrine of salvation at a later stage from in a way that you can be able to present it to someone else. Then we'll go into Christian service, spiritual gifts, and those kind of things. Then we'll go into relationship with God, which entails prayer, the study of the word, and Christian fellowship. So we'll go into that slowly by slowly. Uh, the first phase of our training will take that. And uh, I am so convinced, so convinced that this is going to be transformative. It's going to be so transformative. Uh, and then we will continue training. Uh, on the presentation of the same to the learners. Pastor Gitao just came to me and told me, this thing is good. The, the teachings we are doing right now is good because although he's a, a communicator of the gospel, but he has learned something new from it. So you see, there's no end for learning. There's no end for learning. So just keep your mind open for learning and uh, we will see what God will do with us. So, we'll be moving now to study about the Bible. The Bible. Maybe the question is, why should we study about the Bible? Why should we study about the Bible? If you follow what I've just been teaching here in the morning, then what do we intend to achieve by studying about the Bible? So, we study about the Bible... So as to bring ourselves to a place, we trust the Bible as the word of God and we willingly yield to the authority of the Bible. This is for us here. Those of us who are here, before we transfer it to any other person, we need to reach to a place we trust the Bible as the word of God. And when we say the word of God, then we will want to know that the word of God has no error is very accurate. So we'll look at it as the word of God with no error, with accuracy, which we will seek to willingly yield under the authority of the Bible. This is the, the vision of this small topic. Where are we going? We must reach that place where all of us who are here today can say with confidence the Bible is the word of God. And if you are saying the Bible is the word of God and you know who God is, then you are saying the Bible has no error, the Bible is accurate, then I am willing to trust the Bible, I am willing to yield the authority of the Bible. So I'm just giving an example, like when you are preparing, what are you targeting? So when I'm teaching, this is what I seek to bring out. This is what I seek to bring out. We intend to develop an eight-week uh, series for the Sunday school children, of which we will do together. 
of which we'll do together, but we'll have uh, some actual serious practical trainings here. Uh, that's why you see Madam Principal sitting behind there. We'll have actual serious teaching here, whereby all of us will be asked to prepare a lesson. You are told prepare a lesson about the Bible to the teenagers. Then you come here, we sit down, you teach us. Amen? Amen. We tell you prepare the same, same lesson, maybe to the, to the first, the two years to the five years there. Prepare that lesson, come and teach us. We sit down, we are the two years, we'll disrupt you, say, teacher, I want to go to the toilet, teacher, we just, and you teach us. That's training. You see, we have teaching and training. There are two different things. Yeah. We want to see what the Bible is. So let's look at it generally. Generally, The word Bible is translated from a Greek word called Biblos. B-I-B-L-O-S. Biblos. It's a transliteration. Or a translation from a Greek word called Biblos. Now Biblos has no spiritual meaning. It just means a book. A book. In Greek, Biblos means a book. But when the word Biblos is used theologically, you add the definite article, the. So it becomes the book. In other words, there's no other book. The book. And that's the meaning of the word Bible. So, when you hear the word Bible, you just know it simply means the book. But again, it's a very unique book. The Bible is a unique book. And someone defined it like this. The Bible is a unique library of 66 small books. The Bible is a unique library of 66 small books. So if you, you are carrying a Bible in your hand, you are carrying a whole library. <laughs> you are carrying a whole library. We will have a detailed study of some of these things, but let me mention some of the things that are unique about the Bible to you. We will have a detailed study. But let me just mention some of them. Number one, the Bible has a singular theme from Genesis to Revelation. A singular theme. The Bible has a singular theme. And the theme can be divided into two. One, the revelation of the glory of God, and two, the salvation of man, or the redemption of man. Whenever you are reading the Bible, either the Bible is revealing God so that God can be known and his glory be manifested, or the Bible is talking to you about redemption, salvation. So the Bible is a unique library of 66 small books with a singular theme. Now that in itself alone is a miracle. That just that in itself alone is a miracle. Why is it a miracle? Number one, the Bible was written by 40 different human authors. So you can say, but what is a miracle about that? 40 different human authors, what's a miracle about that? The miracle about 40 different human authors is this, that these human authors lived in 40 different generations. They didn't live in one generation so as to gain the same knowledge and write the same thing. They lived in different generations and in those different generations they span about 1,600 years. So think about it, 40 different men living in a span of 1,600 years, yet maintaining the theme of the book they are writing. What you have in your hands if you have a Bible 
is a supernatural book. Supernatural book. These 40 different writers who lived in a span of 1,600 years, they wrote the Bible in three different languages, which means not all of them could speak the same language. They wrote the Bible in three different languages. The first language of the Bible is called Hebrew. Hebrew. Just like the way the book of Hebrews is written, but you remove S. The second language of the Bible is called Aramaic. A-R-A-M-I-C. Aramaic. Second language of the Bible. Don't worry, we'll look at a, a special uh, lesson to go through all that in the details. But I'm just giving you the uniqueness of the Bible. So the second language of the Bible is Aramaic. The third language of the Bible is Greek. Greek. And that's why you hear men who think they know the Bible so much, they say the Hebrew meaning, the Greek meaning, the Aramaic meaning. They go there so that to, to prove that we know these things. And when we say that, we get more attention. So, three different languages. Now, another miracle is that these men lived in different geographical places. They all didn't come from one place. They lived in different geographical places. So the Bible has 40 different human authors. What makes it unique? It has 40 different human authors, yet it maintains its singular theme. They lived in 40 different generations. These are not people of the same generation to speak the same language, to say to do the same things. They had 40 different generations, which means their experiences, their cultural uh, diversities and everything plays out, yet they maintain the theme of the Bible. It was written over a span of 1,600 years. If you go somewhere else and they tell you 1,700, 1,500, 2,000 years, that's not a problem. It doesn't matter. This is not a, a, a doctrine. But uh, it, most theologians put it between 1,500 to 2,000 years. So it's somewhere there, but let's say 1,600 years. People living in different periods of time, over 1,600 years, yet maintaining the same theme. It's divided into two themes. The glory of God, the glory of God the of man. and the salvation of man. And those themes interplay each other from the beginning to the end. You will see both of them working together from the beginning to the end. Different generations. Yeah, that's also another uniqueness. Three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And the Bible still holds together as a united document. United document. If you have a Bible in your hands, that's the first miracle you have. It's a supernatural book. It's a no supernatural book. Now, <clears throat> another thing about the Bible is the most influential book ever written in human history. It is the most influential book ever written in human history. Think about it. If we reach there today, there's something we'll learn about the external evidence that the Bible is the word of God. One of the external evidence of the, the Bible is the word of God is its influence on humanity. I know in our life we have testimonies of people who say how the word of God has impacted them. Including ourselves. Yeah? Praise God. Praise God again. You know those statements? The Bible is the most influential book in the human history. And this is the miracle about the Bible. It was among the first books to go in print. When they were printing the Bible it was illegal to print the Bible in English. It was illegal, but the Bible was first printed in English. When the machines for printing was invented in Germany, it was among the first books to go in print in English. And from that time, it has sold over 5 billion copies. 
five billion copies. There is no other book in the whole world that has sold that. So the Bible is the best seller. Now, maybe it's the best seller because it has good stories. No. In as much as it's the best seller, it's the book that is most opposed in the world. It's the book that is most fought, most challenged. It's very hard to find someone challenging a Quran or the book of the Hindu, the religion of the Hindu, but everybody has focused his guns to challenge the Bible. And the more they challenge it, the more it sells. And the more it influences the human history. Now, the Bible has been translated in more than 2,000 human languages in the world. Over 2,000 human languages. Now, to some areas in this world, like uh, areas, Islamic areas, areas of Buddhism, areas of communism, the Bible is considered like a dangerous weapon. It's a dangerous book. It's categorized among the most dangerous things in the world. <laughs> That's why a person walking with a gun can be set free in an Islamic country, but a person walking with a Bible will be killed. If you want to test that, just go to Mogadishu with a Bible in the hand and see if you will come back. So the Bible is considered as dangerous literature. But in as much as it's considered as dangerous literature, most laws of most countries come from the Bible. Most laws of most countries come from the Bible. This is a theological lesson, by the way, so expand your territories. Yeah, capacity, build the capacity to learn it. <laughs> it's a theological lesson. And it's good for a teacher to have a background of what the Bible is before you start telling people things from the Bible. The dangerous literature of the Bible has never stopped the Bible from being sold because even where the Bible is opposed, we have what we call underground churches still reading the Bible. So people can risk their life to study the Bible. People can risk their life. It's amazing. How do you, why should you risk your own life just, you just want to study the contents of a book? It's amazing. It's awesome. It's something that you need just to think about and love the Bible. And stop hiding it when you carry it. Carry it with pride. Let people know you have a miracle in your hand. I'm one person who don't carry my Bible secretly. Secretly in, or in bags. Or, I want everybody to know that man has a Bible. So what is the Bible? Let me give you a simple way of what the Bible is. The Bible is the story of everything. In your imagination, eh, think about something you cannot find in the Bible. It's the story of everything. And the Bible holds the answers to all questions. The Bible is the story of everything. The Bible holds the answers to all questions. If your child asks you, where did these birds come from? Where do you get the answer? Why do people get married? Where do you get the answer? Why do people die? Where do you get the answer from? Why are people fighting? You, everything that happens in the world... You get the answers from the Bible. Every question, even those stupid questions that children ask, the answers are found in the Bible. So it holds the answers to all questions. The Bible will tell you about life. The Bible will tell you about death. That is it. It's a love letter. The Bible is a love letter. It's the mind of God. But let me see, if you ask yourself, if you stop somewhere and you don't understand life and uh, you just ask yourself, who am I? Where do you get the answers from? The Bible. Who am I? Where did I come from? These are important questions, write them down. Who am I? 
And we must reach a level as teachers of the word to explain who am I? Who am I? Where did I come from? You know, you know we have ch children like Lorraine who have never been in the village. If you ask them, where does milk come from? They say in the fridge. They have never seen a cow. <laughs> in the supermarket. Eh? IV, you see? IV knows milk comes from a supermarket. It takes uh, someone who has seen cows and knows farming to explain to you before the milk comes to the supermarket, it, 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 it belongs to a cow. So sometimes you think you came from your mother and father. But you have a bigger question you need to answer. Where did I come from? Because if you start defining yourself using your father and mother, then you lose the focus. That's why you see some people, because I'm an orphan, you behave badly because you're an orphan. You have a deeper meaning in life more than your father and mother. So if you knew the question of where I come from, it helps you focus in life in the right direction. But there's another question that you need to ask yourself, what am I doing here? Why am I here in this world? You can go to all schools, all universities, you can never get an answer to that question until you consult the book. The book. Biblos. Hmm? What am I doing here? Why am I here? Now, if you understood why am I here, there's another question that we need to get from the Bible is, am I accountable to anyone? Do I answer to anybody? Now, think about it. Those of us who are here, if you answer that question, yes, I'm accountable to somebody. You are asked to who? You say the pastor. So, if the pastor is not there, then I'm not accountable. So when you ask yourself, am I accountable to anybody? You need to seek answers from the Bible. And uh, the question I really want to, if I was not within context, as I said, who is in control of the universe? So I can teach about Corona. Who is in control of things? When you see things happening, you need to understand who is in control. Who is the director of all this? Who is in control of the human existence? Who is in control of the animal existence? Who is in control of the birds in the air, the existence, the fish in the sea? Who is in control of the existence? Who is in control of this climate and changes we have around? Who is in control? Those are questions that we will need to seriously answer when we are looking at what the Bible is. So the Bible holds the answers to all questions. And I, I believe in due time, we'll find answers to those questions that we have just said, a few of those questions we've said. Another thing about the Bible is that the Bible contains unique teaching. The Bible has unique teaching incomparable to no other book in human history. The teaching of the Bible is incomparable to no other book in human history. And we, we look at that in a short while if we look at uh, the Bible as the word of God. Then we'll understand the uniqueness of the teachings. Just as a theologian said somewhere, the Bible is the only book you read when the author is sitting with you. If you like reading novels, you can read many novels when, of which the authors have died. Like the other day, we lost a very great author here in Kenya, Ken Walibora. But you can still read his books. But Ken Walibora is in the grave. But the author of the book is always with you when you are reading it. It's a very unique book with unique teachings. But again, the teachings have been uniquely preserved over ages. Uniquely preserved over ages. The teachings of the Bible were combined by men of God who came together. They picked different teachings where they had been written on scrolls and on papyri. Don't worry about those words. 
and they put them together in a, a process that was called canonization. Canonization is the compiling of the Bible together into one book. And later, some writings have been found in different places, but those writings always confirm what is in the Bible. Ancient writings by ancient men who are there during the times of Jesus, the times of Noah, have been found in deep seas, wherever they have been found. But everything from those writings, they have never contradicted the Bible. Okay, think about it. Even science itself cannot contradict the Bible. Can't contradict the Bible. This is a supernatural book. Science may go around and say, oh, there was an explosion and things happened, but okay, let's cool down. So nothing happened from nothing. So what has stopped this from happening now? They tell you a molecule did, did something. So if there was a molecule, then this molecule had a source. Science will go round and round and end up on God. Whether it likes or it doesn't like. That's why science is a discovery and not an invention. It's not a creation. Science discovers. And Ivy knows she's a scientist. We talk about scientific discoveries. Like right now they are looking for medicine for corona. They'll discover it. God has it. <laughs> they will discover it. <laughs> the preservation of Bible writing is the one that is amazing. Because, for example, let's just, let's just look at an example. Who wrote the first five books of the Bible? Moses. So, who was uh, created first, Moses or Adam? But Moses gives a narration of Adam's creation. So you ask yourself, how did Moses know? We, we will look at it with what we call inspiration. The Bible is inspired of God. So, but in simple terms, God directed Moses on what to write. Moses was influenced, guided, and directed by God because all this information is with God. All this information was preserved by God using specific men, and now God helped Moses, guided him, influenced him, inspired him to do what he did and come up with the Torah. Do you know even in the first books of the Bible, even Moses talks about his death and before he dies. He says how he died and how he was buried. Let's see, let's see Deuteronomy. If you go to Deuteronomy 34, Look at verse 1. The Bible says, Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of uh, Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead afar as Dan, all Naphtali, and all the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the western sea, the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the seat of palm trees, as far as Zohar. Then the Lord said to Moses, This is the land of which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I'll give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. This is a discussion between the loving God and his servant Moses, telling him you will not go over there. So verse 5, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. How can Moses himself write and say Moses the servant of God died there? Okay, let's continue. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth. Moses knows how he died. He knows how he was buried. And no one knows the grave of Moses up to this day. And who is writing this book? It's amazing. Now if you want to ask, maybe when you go to heaven, ask God, how is this possible? How is this possible, God? That this man says, I died, I was buried. You know, 
the divine preservation of the word of God is very unique in the entire Bible. God has preserved the Bible against every human violence. God has preserved his word. Against every human distortion, because when you look at uh, different versions of the Bible, even humanity has tried to distort the Bible. There are people who have come up and say, the Bible is not favoring women, we want a feminine Bible. They have come with a, with a feminine Bible. But God has preserved the Bible doctrine. There's even a gay Bible. Everything, everything is a Bible, Bible, Bible. But it's a book. But we have the book. So you can see the unique preservation of the Bible. Now, some of the things that the Bible explains also is, who is God? Write those questions down. Who is God? What is God's plan for the human race? What is God's plan for the human race? How does God want us to relate to his plan? How does God want us to relate to his plan? Then the Bible explains also the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus and what did he do? Who is Jesus and what did he do? I remember when we were in our training here, our teacher tried to, to, to show us how you need to know who Jesus is and what did he do. So, for example, if I shout the answer to me if you know. So who is uh, Uhuru Kenyatta? The president of Kenya. So who is Trump? The president of the United States. <laughs> you see? Who is Mandela? So the same way you can answer those questions, you need to answer who is Christ. But you will not get that answer from other books on the shelves. The only place you will get that answer accurately is from the Bible. What did he do? Then you can start understanding the ministry of Christ Jesus. Then you, you will now understand how man needs to relate to the ministry of Christ also. Now, in this part of the Bible, where it's about the glory of God and the salvation of man, this is a part that has inspired many people, but also confused many others. Because if you don't relate to the Bible accurately, you will be confused. And you will end up with the religious sects. If you don't relate to the Bible teaching concerning who is God, what is his plan, how does he want us to relate to it, who is Christ Jesus, what did he come to do, how does he want us to relate to what he came to do. If you don't have the right, accurate teachings from the Bible about this, you end up in a confused state. So, everybody needs to seek to understand what the Bible is teaching with accuracy with accuracy. The question is, why should we study what the Bible is? Let's go to the beginning there, that Colossians scripture. Why should we study what the Bible is? And we have a scripture there that Paul was talking to the church of, the church of Christ at Colossi, the Colossian church, in Colossians chapter number 1, verse 9 to 11, he was telling them, that for this reason we also, since the day we had it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worth of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in, in the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering. All patience and long suffering. Now look at that verse just keenly for a minute. Keenly for a minute. Paul says he has heard about the faith of the church at Colossae and now he's telling them 
He is praying for them. And the first thing he wants them to do is to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom. To be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom. So we have knowledge and we have wisdom. We normally say wisdom is the practical application of knowledge. So we have knowledge and we have the application of the knowledge. Wisdom is knowledge in action. You know, sometimes we have knowledge and you just keep quiet. You see things going wrong, you just keep quiet with the knowledge. You say, I just knew. Then you are the most unwise person that has ever lived on this earth. Because your knowledge must be active. Must be practical. So knowledge in action is wisdom. And that's why they say you can mistake a fool who is quiet to be wise because he's not acting. It's only when people act that you know if they have knowledge or they don't have knowledge. To be filled with the knowledge of his will and the knowledge you are getting filled of is of his will. You need to know what is the purpose of God for my life? What is his will? What is his plan? What does he want me to do? Although most spiritual people have taken this too far, they even say, what does God want me to wear? <laughs> I know God wants you to wear well, to be modest, but I don't think God can tell you, don't put on the white one today, put on the red one. <laughs> the will of God concerns, one, the individual life of a believer, the individual life of a believer. Two, the existence of the church on earth. The existence of the church on earth. Three, marriage. There's a will of God concerning marriage. The institution of marriage. The institution of marriage. And four, the institution of governance. There's a will of God of how nations should be governed. In as much as we say that all leaders come from God, but there's the will of God on how leaders are supposed to govern the people in that nation. You'll find the will of God providing specific principles, specific uh, commands, specific prescriptions for those four areas. Those four areas. And I'm not saying the Lord cannot tell you not to put on a black one. To use the red one. That's up to you and the God how you communicate. It's between you and God. <laughs> he wants to be involved even in the small matters of our lives. So when you pray about what to put on, it's good. It's good. So, we want to first define the Bible that it is where we can get his knowledge and how to apply his knowledge in our life. The Bible says that you may walk worth of the Lord. So when it comes to walking worth of the Lord, is not the practical application of the knowledge of the Bible. Then, then, most grace preachers don't like hearing this, that you need to be fully pleasing to him. Most grace preachers say, it's God who is pleased with me. I don't have to be pleasing to him. But the Bible demands, the word of God demands, that once you are filled with the knowledge of his will, you have wisdom, you walk worth of the, your calling, and you are fully pleasing to God. Fully pleasing to God. Yes, God is pleased with us. We are not challenging that. But he's saying, why don't you respond and also be pleasing to him? So fully pleasing to him. And another one is being fruitful in every good work. You see where, from the Bible you can get all that. You can get the, the ability, the energy, the strength to be fruitful, the power to be fruitful in every, every, every good work and increasing in knowledge of God. You see, first of all, you gain knowledge but you do what? You increase in knowledge. 
you increase in knowledge. So it is very dangerous for us when we gain some knowledge to think that now we have all knowledge. At every given time, we must remain students, learners of the word of God. Amen? At every given time, consider yourself a learner, a student. Develop capacity for more. Develop capacity for more. So, uh, increasing in knowledge, strengthen with all might. Now you see when you are increasing in knowledge, you are strengthened with all might. This is the power of God now. You get your strength from God according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering. So you need patience and long-suffering when you are uh, uh, living on this earth and when you are serving God. We said, if you want now to attach the Bible to God, you define it as the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. Immediately you say like that, we among learned people, you have problems. And I'll show you some of the problems you'll encounter immediately. You will have problems. Because you'll be taken to Genesis chapter 3 verse 4. You'll be asked, is this the word of God? What does Genesis chapter 3 verse 4 say? Uh -huh. So, if you tell accomplished theologians that the Bible is the word of God, they tell you no. No, 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 no. The Bible cannot be the word of God because the Bible contains the words of Satan. <laughs> but we will maintain that the Bible is the word of God. That whatsoever things that are in the Bible, they are the ones that God has allowed it to be in the Bible. Not that God approves and affirms them as truth, but he has allowed them to be in the Bible for our learning. Do you get that? Although they are in the Bible, but God does not approve them and affirm them to be truth, but he says it happened and faithfully he allows it to be in the Bible for our learning. So the Bible is still the word of God. And look at it like this. Moses was not there when the serpent was tempting Eve. So Moses was given this information by God. So it's God himself who wanted that information to be in the Bible. So, the Bible is the word of God. Let's read our scripture. Let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy quickly. Chapter 3. From verse 40, the Bible says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, Knowing from whom you have learned them. <laughs> Knowing from whom you have learned them. Okay. So verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now are you seeing the importance of the Bible? The Bible is being called the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul comes to explain what is all scriptures. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> it was inspired by God. So once you understand that all scripture, the question is, is Genesis chapter 3 verse 4 all part of the scripture? Yes. So was it given by the inspiration of God? Yes. So the Bible is the word of God. There are so many arguments to us that we will uh, handle them as we go by. From the scripture we have just read, you can say the Bible declares itself to be the word of God. In the theology it's called the internal evidence. Internal evidence. Within the pages of the Bible, 
there is a self-declaration that I am the word of God. So let's, let's go back a little bit. When you say the word of God, what is the meaning of the word? The word. What is the meaning of that? Before we reach there, that's the theological understanding later, it's higher than where we are. So before we reach there, we can describe the word as the expressed or manifested mind and will of God. An expressed or manifested mind and will of God. You see, you can have something on your mind and you keep quiet, but when you express it or manifest it, it is the word of God. <laughs> okay, a simple way, everything that God said. Everything that God said. But you can say an expressed or manifested mind and will of God. Now the Greeks have two different words for the same word as the word. They sometimes use the word logos, L-O-G-O-S, logos, to mean the word of God, but they sometimes use the word rema, R-H-E-M-A, R-H-E-M-A, rema. So in the Bible, you'll find an interplay between Logos and Rema, and the dividing line is very small, very thin. The dividing line is very thin between Rema and Logos, but they all mean the word of God. So let, let's just let's allow this to sink. Let's allow this to sink. If the moment you say the Bible is the word of God, what happens to you immediately? If someone knocks on your door and says, uh, uh, Jen has sent me for 500 shillings. You have the 500 shillings on your, in your pocket. And you ask, and who is Jen? You say, but Jen is that woman who lives there. You've never met Jen. You don't know who Jen is. Will you give this 500 shillings? Because the word that you have been given, you cannot trace it to the source. So a word is as important as the one who said it. The speaker, the one who spoke it. Or the one who is communicating on behalf of the uh, on behalf of the one who said it. Someone can communicate on behalf. So the word is as important as the one who spoke it. That's why the people you respect when they speak, you attend to that voice. You attend to that voice. When children respect their parents, if you are teaching children, you can show them when they respect their parents, when a parent speaks and sends you, you go quickly because you respect the source of the word. Now we learn to do that practically by respecting our parents, respecting our elders, respecting our teachers, respect because you, you hold them in a place of honor. Now you cannot respect the Bible until you hold God in a place of honor. So we say the Bible is the word of God. It's the expressed or manifested mind and will of God. But you need to have a relationship with this God. Honor him first before you relate to his word. The word of God is a saying or something that was spoken by God. You may say the word of God also may mean a divine revelation or declaration. A divine revelation or declaration. When you say the Bible is the word of God, you are saying the Bible is a divine revelation. The Bible is a divine declaration. A divine declaration. I look at Paul in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. He really wants to go and preach in a particular place, 
But he said he was told not to go there by the Spirit of God. You know, when the Spirit of God speaks to Paul, he changes direction because he knows the source of that word. So every time you are interacting with the Bible, you need to know that this is the word of God. It's a word from the most powerful, most sovereign, most supreme person of the universe. And therefore, I must relate to the Bible with a lot of reverence. And reverence is not holding it. No, reverence means you honor what is written in the Bible. Praise God. You honor what is written in the Bible. So, just by understanding that the Bible is the word of God is enough for you to relate to the word with reverence, with awe. You can't take the word of God casually if you know who God is. You cannot say, although he said like this, but let's look at it. We know we are human beings. Let's look at it from another human viewpoint. Uh -uh. When God has spoken, he has spoken. He knows he was speaking to human beings. He's all-knowing. We will learn about him and you will discover he's all-knowing. He sees your thoughts from a five years before you think them. And he knows we have weaknesses, we have limitations, but again he knows we have the capacity to obey his word. So just by knowing the Bible is the word of God, changes your lifestyle. Amen? Does it make sense to you? It changes your lifestyle. There are people, if you went to them and uh, told them, uh, I need this favor, he'll tell you, uh, I don't have time. Then you say, it's the pastor who sent me to tell you. He says, let's go now. <laughs> it, it makes a difference. The source makes a difference. So, the, the word carries the authority of the speaker. The word bears or carries the authority of the speaker or the one who spoke it. I, I have missed my mother so much and my father so much. I really want to go to the village and see them. They are weaklings. I take them to the doctor. I take care of them. I really want to go to the village and see them. But yesterday a man said fellow Kenyans, He said to fellow Kenyans, for another 30 days you stay in Nairobi, you cannot go anywhere. I can't go to see my mother because the man who spoke carries authority to deny me access to my parents. You see, he was not struggling and sweating and, do, and no, he just said a simple word, fellow Kenyans, you will not go anywhere, you stay in Nairobi. And we stayed. <laughs> another 30 days. I want to go and preach the gospel. I want to crisscross this country, but fellow Kenyans. That's how powerful a word is. If the chief of Umoja went on TV and said, fellow Kenyans, <laughs> will you be? <laughs> so every time you hear the word of God, you are hearing the power of God, the authority of God. Praise God. Sometimes the word of God means the expression or a communication concerning Bible doctrine. Uh, when you hear the word of God, it, it may also mean divine expression or a communication concerning Bible doctrine. Bible doctrine. Bible doctrines are just basic teachings that you should live by. Divine expression or a communication concerning Bible doctrine. Divine expression or communication concerning Bible doctrine. So like when you are confused and you don't know what does this mean, then you go to look for divine expression or communication concerning that doctrine. It's found in the Bible. Now later we will look at what we call the divisions of the Bible. Then we look at uh, the historical narrations of the Bible. We look at the commands in the Bible. 
We look at the teachings and promises of God in the Bible. We look at the prophetic pronouncement in the Bible. We look at it under something called the divisions of the Bible. We'll look at that later. But now, the word of God is an expression or a manifestation of the mind and will of God. Or if you don't want to say so many things, say everything which God says is the word of God. Eh? Everything that God says is the word of God. Now, so the question is, how did the things that God say come into a book? Then we come to understand, although it is the word of God, but it was put in the book by human authors. God did not sit down to write the Bible himself. The human authors. And many human authors never shied away from saying that I have heard from God and this is what God has said. They, they never shied away from saying like that. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. From verse 1. Let's do a long reading. Deuteronomy 6 from verse 1. The Bible says, Now this is the commandment and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you. You see, Moses is not pretending like uh, he has this private understanding of these great things and he wants to speak. He's not saying that he's the all-knowing guy he wants to know. He says, I have things I want to teach you, but I have received them from the Lord your God. I have received a commandment from the Lord your God to teach you. He's not shying away from saying that the things I'm about to tell you, they come from the Lord your God. So let's, let's, let's continue reading. Bible says, now this is the commandment and these are the statutes of, and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. That you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life and that you, your days may be prolonged. Verse 3, therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Verse 6, And this, words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. Now look at that. Moses is saying, this is the word of God that I'm about to teach you. But then he goes on to explain the seriousness of relating to this word of God. Now think about it. Bind it on your hand. Put it on your neck. Put it as a, as a frontlet here. What is all this? It's just telling you that this word is important, of uttermost importance in your life. Uttermost importance of life. So one, one thing, Moses never hides the fact that what I am saying comes from God. Number two, he gives the importance of right relationship with what God says. The right relationship with what God says. You live a successful, a prosperous life when you relate a right with what God says. In other words, the word of God carries the power and authority of God to bring transformation, to bring influence in your life. That's all that Moses is saying. Moses is saying, this word that I've been commanded to teach you today, if only you can take it serious, your lives will be completely transformed. 
That's why we insist the word is as authoritative, as powerful, as important as the speaker. The word of a man is the man. <laughs> Fellow Kenyans, eh? the word of a man is the man. So if you look at the, at the example of uh, the Deuteronomy way I've read from verse, chapter 6, verse 1 to 9, you see how Moses extols the importance of relating right to the word of God. And I want that to be insisted. The moment you say the Bible is the word of God, it's just not something you are mentioning. You need to have so much in the back of your mind as you say the Bible is the word of God. You are saying this is the authority that I have in my life. This is the power that I have in my life. This is my guide, my influence. Is the word of God. I want us to look at uh, several scriptures about the Bible as the word of God. I don't know where to begin. I thought I'd skip them. Just read the Bible. If we have had the agreement that is, is that important. Are we agreeing? That the Bible is supreme. It doesn't matter which other books you have ever read. Eh? Atomos importance. If we succeed on relating to the Bible as the word of God, today, that's sufficient. That's sufficient. So let's begin somewhere. Let's begin in 2 Samuel. There's a lesson here we'll be doing about the books of the Bible. And uh, Joyce will be teaching us a song on the books of the Bible. How you can remember all the books of the Bible. We have a lesson and I think you have a, a, a something on, on that in your notes. So, <laughs> are you? Second Samuel? <laughs> Chapter 22? Verse 31 and 32. We are just looking at the Bible as the word of God. Verse 31, and it says... As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust him. Verse 32. For who is God except the Lord? Who is a rock except our God? Amen. So look at that. Look at that scripture there. The Bible is the word of God. And the Bible says here, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? Look at that. That his word is proven. His word is proven. You know, the Western people, they are looking for a cure for corona, a vaccine for corona. And they will come to test it in Africa to prove if it works. In Kenya. Because you cannot just say this thing is working. You must test it somewhere and prove it. But concerning the word of God, the Bible says it is already proven. You don't need to test it. You don't have to say, let me try and believe God to see if it works. No. The word of God is proven. And if the Bible says in the first uh, part of that verse, as for God, his ways is perfect, the word of God is part of that perfection. So the word of God is perfect, is proven, is a shield to all who trust in him. So the moment you understand that the Bible is the word of God. And the moment you convince yourself that the Bible is the word of God. These scriptures jump on your mind. You put them on the forefront of your thinking when you are facing any situation. That the word of God is perfect, is proven, is a shield to all those who trust in him. That's the power of taking God at his word. The Bible is the word of God. You need to know where is this coming from. If the source is powerful, then the word is powerful. If the source is perfect, the word is perfect. Let's go to Psalms. I've chosen to go slowly. I've chosen to go slowly. If the only thing we live here today knowing is that the Bible is the word of God. And then we know who that God is. So that now we can start relating to the Bible aright. 
So Psalms, let's start with Psalms chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord, you shall preserve them from this generation forever. Wow. Wow. The word of the Lord is pure. It's pure. I am changing the words of the Lord are pure words like silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times what is the meaning of seven times in the in the in theological meaning seven complete perfection seven times okay just by understanding this then you have no doubt about the word of God. That the word of God is pure. Pure. There's a day I was teaching in Narok. And a young man came from Kisi. Uh, he listened to me. Then he called his pastor. Called him he say, during a break. He said, pastor, this man is teaching pure grace. I, I didn't know what pure grace is by then. Me, I was just teaching the word of God. I said, this man is teaching pure grace. So I asked him, do you have other diluted or corrupted graces? So, but the word of God is pure. Every time you are reading this word, it brings refreshment. You know when you have been walking in a, in a, in a, a, being scorched with the sun and you arrive in the house and you get that cold glass of water and you take it down. That ah, feeling you have. The same feeling you should have when you are reading the word of God. It's pure. It's pure. Tested and proven seven times. So you don't need to test and prove the word of God. It's already proven. It's already tested. Then it says, you shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. So the word of God was kept and preserved by God himself. It was kept and preserved by God himself from one generation to another generation. Psalm 119. Let's go through some scriptures. I want you to be equipped. And I want you to love the word of God, the Bible. So Psalm 119. Let's read from verse 9 to 11 first. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Look at that. So if someone comes to you and saying, I'm struggling with sin, what is the problem? It's not hiding the word of God in the heart. This is when you say hiding the word of God, you may wonder, how do you hide the word of God? You learn the word of God. You don't take it as the word of God. You don't believe it as the word of God. You don't relate to it as the word of God. You will struggle in life. You will struggle in life. And that's why the psalmist says here, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Taking heed. Healing to the word of God. Honoring the word of God. Submitting to the word of God. Living by the word of God. So you can easily, instead of telling someone go for deliverance, the problem is not deliverance. The problem is how he relates to the word of God. If you know this is the word of God, how you relate to that word of God makes a big difference. A big difference. And we thank God is the young man who read it. A man is a, a man, in a, both female. Yeah. Read, read verse 9 again. <laughs> How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Taking heed according to your word. Submitting to the word of God. Honoring the word of God. Treating the word of God with reverence. That's the only way. Only way you can overcome this world. And then... He later comes to say in verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So you see, when you believe the word of God, it's like hiding the word of God 
in the heart. When you put faith in the word of God, when you trust the word of God, when you are con convinced that what the word of God is saying is true, then is hiding the word of God in your soul. There's a man who said the soul has two compartments. One is for every information you gain, but the other one is for that information you trust as truth. It hides itself in there. It becomes part of your frame of reference in life. Whether you know it or you don't know, you start acting from that which you have hidden in your soul. You start behaving like that which you have hidden in your soul. The things that you believe and you have trusted, they are hidden in your soul and they, they are the ones that guide you on how to live a day-to-day -day life. The word of God can rescue and cleanse you from all kinds of wildness. Verse 8 and 9, and read up to 94, 8 and 9 to 94. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. Just, just hold on there. Okay. So the word of God is that what? Is settled. Completely settled in heaven. God does not want to improve on it. God is not doing research on how can I make my word better. Is completely settled in heaven. And he would like the same to happen here. Let your will be done as it is in heaven. Let it be done also where? On earth. So God will want his word also to be settled in our hearts, in our souls, that this is the truth. Regardless of the circumstances we are facing, we need to settle and know that whatever God says, he means it. It is business. It is the truth. We don't allow our circumstances to define how we relate to the word of God. We trust the word of God because it's completely settled in heaven. Continue. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You established the earth and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances for all are your servants. Unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. Look at that. Look at that. The psalmist understands the power, the authority of the word of God, and it says clearly here, unless your law had been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Sometimes when you see in the Old Testament your law, your precepts, your oracles, it's the same, same, the word of God. So he says, the way I have trusted your word has made a whole lot of difference in my life, not only when things are good, but even the times of afflictions. By the way, our problem is never trusting God when things are good. Our problem is trusting that God is still in control, he's still a shield, he's still faithful when you are undergoing afflictions. Even John the Baptist doubted and said, is he the one or we should wait for another one to come? Because that painful moment, you start hearing voices, God is punishing you, God has forsaken you, God is doing this, or oh, it's the end of the world. You start hearing those voices. But now, if you understand that the Bible is the word of God, that word of God that you have learned, believed, and hidden in your soul remains your shield even in the time of affliction. So let's go quickly, verse 104. 104 and 105. Verse 104. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Look at that. Through your precepts, I get understanding. And because I get understanding through your precepts, I now have hated the contrary. He's talking about now the personal influence the word of God has had in his life, the personal manifestation of the word of God in his life, and he has loved what the word of God is doing in his life. And he says, if this is what the word of God is doing to me, I hate the contrary. But again, he explains in verse 105 that your word, one of my favorite scriptures, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know what the psalmist says? 
I cannot make any movement in life without consulting your word. Because your word is my guide. Your word is my influence. Your word is my counsel. Your word is my paracletos. Without your word, I cannot move. It means we are living in a dark world. And in this dark world, unless the light of God shines in a place that you must pass, you are not sure of what you are doing. You start living a life of guessing. You don't know if you are putting your feet in the right place. But this is not just talking about how we walk. is our mindset. Our lifestyle. We need a lifestyle that is controlled, guided by the word of God. So when we understand that the Bible is the word of God, it makes all this difference. It becomes our day-to-day -day guide in this dark world. Our day-to-day -day guide in this dark world. So let's read the last psalm. Verse 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. The entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So it doesn't matter how people consider you to be foolish. All you need is what? The entrance of the word of God. You know, it's amazing. You look at people like Peter and John, people who are at school in the natural academics, but when they stand before men of letters, men who have the qualification of judges like Gamaliel, Peter and John stands before them and the wisdom of Peter and John challenges the wisdom of Gamaliel and his fellow judges. And they say, there's something about this man. What is it about them? That they were with Christ. So you see what the power of the word of God, it gives you what the world can never give you. Do you get it? The word of God gives you the wisdom, the understanding. You can navigate this world in a wisdom that no academics will give you. I was very happy the other day when uh, Murkomen was being crucified. He said, there's no bishop in this world who can come and unite us. You know, that was very good. He was crying and saying, there's no bishop in this country who can intervene in what is happening. He has known that natural wisdom has come to its end. And there's that time that natural wisdom can never help you. Natural education can never help you. Every power and authority of this world can never help you. Only one thing can help you at that time. The word of God. Praise God. Amen. The word of God. So let's go. Let's go, let's go to Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. So every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. Then, you are being told he is a shield to those who put their trust in him. So, when the Bible says every word of God is pure, then it says he is a shield to those who put their trust in him. What are you trusting? What are you really trusting? First of all, you are trusting what God has said, and by so you are trusting God. You are trusting what God has said, and by so doing, you are trusting God. So every word of God is pure. So every time you hear the Bible, and you say the Bible is the word of God, what follows? Every word of God is pure. So when you are relating to it, you are relating to it without any fear, with the maximum trust for it, with honor, with commitment, with submission, because you know every word of God is pure. Praise God. So he's a shield to all those who trust on him. And then verse 6 is a warning. Do not add to his word, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. 
So when you add to the word of God, who is a liar, you or God? <laughs> but you are being told there's a danger of being found a liar. So also as a communicator of the word of God, even as we teach the children, as we communicate the word of God to the children, we need to know when we are communicating the word of God to the children, we do not have to add or subtract from the word of God because you will be found to be a liar. And if the judge of the judges finds you to be a liar, I don't know what verdict he'll pass. Isaiah 55 verse 10. I know you know that one off head. You can sing it, but let's read it. Isaiah 55 verse 10 and 11. Isaiah 55 verse 10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to, and to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from your mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. We know the Bible is the word of God. Sindio? So, now Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11, is trying to tell us now what the word of God is like. And in verse 10, it says, it compares it to the rain, for as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth bad, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So look at this scripture here. It's saying the word of God, if you want to understand how it works, just get out of your house, look at how the rain works. Rain falls from heaven down. Then before you know, the whole place is green. Before you know. How much does the soil struggle to make the place green? What credit can the soil take? The only thing that the soil needs to do is to absorb the rain. Absorb the rain. After the soil absorbs the rain, then the results come. No wonder you are made from dust. So that you can absorb the word of God. <laughs> but look at it. Look at the next verse. Verse 11. It says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things of which I send it. Now look at that word. It accomplishes what God pleases, not what we please, and number two, in the things for which I sent it. You know, we have always wanted to um, twist God to use his word to do the things we want to do. But God says, I'm the one who sent forth this word. I have a purpose for sending forth this word, and there is no way at all at all this word can come to you and not accomplish what I sent it to do, all you need to do is receive this word. Because if you receive the word of God, it's as if you have received God himself, because the word carries the same authority as the speaker, as the source. The word carries the same authority as the source. So if you look at this scripture here, it can teach us on how to relate to the word of God. So when we say the Bible is the word of God, then you have this scripture in mind. What are you doing? You are putting more trust in the word of God, in the Bible, because you know this word, when I read it and understand it with accuracy, it will definitely accomplish the purpose of God in my life. Definitely. And God has assured you, it will definitely accomplish his purpose in your life. You know, sometimes when it rains in a place, even this place, if we, if we just left here, if we were not coming here completely for these three months, if you came here, there will be no place for you to sit. All this place will be having very long grass. So sometimes when the, the word of God is beginning to work in your life, you are already trying to try some other things and try this and try this and try this. The word of God is beginning to work. You don't want the word of God to produce a tree in your life immediately. It is working progressively. In your life. So you need just to keep trusting it and trusting it and trusting it. And the goodness of rain, it doesn't just pour one day. It rains and rains and rains and rains. 
So we need to expose ourselves to the word of God now and then, now and then, now and then, until God says, I've sent this word for a purpose and let it accomplish that purpose in your life. No wonder Samuel said, here I am, God. Praise God. Here I am. So Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, mm -hmm. and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Wow. So the word of God is like what? Two things. Number one. Number two. So this fire is not destructive fire. It's good fire. Well, the Bible is just telling you that the word of God is powerful and can also achieve that which God sent it to do. It's not my word like a fire, says the Lord. If you read verse 29, the Bible says, The prophet who has a dream, let him tell the dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord. So what is the fire coming to do? Yeah, burn the chaff. When we'll be learning uh, Bible study methods, we'll be learning about context. Context. So, the fire is not coming to destroy you. The fire is coming to destroy what? The chaff. You are not the target of the fire. Actually, the fire is coming to purify. The hammer is not coming to break you down. The hammer is coming to break the heart of stone to leave the heart of flesh. The hammer is not to destroy you. Now, I've heard people telling others, can you come and speak to my brother? Maybe he'll listen to you. Then you say, I will come. He says, hey, who yo? We are tired. Where is he? So, the word of God is like a hammer. It doesn't matter how difficult he is, when the word of God penetrates his heart, it destroys the hardest of the hearts and gives him the heart of flesh so that he can hear the word of God. The power is in the word of God. It has the ability to purify, take away all the chaff, all the impurities, take them away and leave you a pure child of God. It has the power to break that hardness and make you submit to the word of God. It's like a hammer. So, if you knew the word of God is like a hammer, you don't want that hammer to work on you. So you just submit in advance. <laughs> you submit in advance so that you have no problem. So let's look at the New Testament. There are several scriptures. There are hundreds of scriptures in the Old Testament, the Gospels. But let's now just go to the New Testament and look at some of some two, three scriptures that have an internal claim that the Bible is the word of God. An internal claim, an internal Evidence that the Bible is the word of God. So let's quickly go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We'll be opening this Bible. During these trainings, we'll be opening this Bible. So better get used to it. Mm -hmm. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is truth, the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. Just look at that. Look at that. Apostle Paul is telling the people of uh, the church of the Thessalonians that when you received us, you also received our word, which was the word of God. So, you can see the human messenger in that place. God does not speak. Oh, that says the Lord. Most people are still looking for that. And when we look at the doctrine of inspiration of God, we'll see that. But God has spoken through men. And the word is the same, same word of God. He has spoken through his messengers. He spoke through the apostles. He spoke through the prophets of the Old Testament. He spoke through the psalmists. He spoke to many people in the Old Testament. And here Paul says, for this reason we also thank God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God which you heard from us. 
So these are human messenger of the word of God. Now look at it. You welcomed it. What was the relation of the people to the word of God? They received it. They welcomed it. That simply means they believed. They acknowledged that this is the true word of God. They believed. Then when they welcomed it, not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. So they received it as the word of God. You see the difference? The word of man does not carry the same authority as the word of God. If I come here and say, so and so has sent me, is so different when, and with when I open the Bible and say, let's read the Thessalonians. The word of God carries the power of God, the authority of God, and deserves to be trusted, to be received with honor. Amen? And now, when it's received with honor, there is the impact it produces in your life. The Bible says, which also effectively works in you who believe. It has an effect. The effectual working of the word of God in believers is evident. We said in the beginning that the Bible is the most influential book in human history. It has influenced people in an evident way. You can see people, you can say, this one, were it not for the word of God, he will not be where he is. And if you are honest, you can look at your own life, examine yourself, and say, were it not the word of God I absorbed in my life, I'll not be where I am. So the word of God works effectually. It produces results, like Isaiah has told us in Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. The word of God produces results. It never returns void. And therefore, the Bible is the word of God. The Bible produces results. Amen? First Peter chapter 1. Let's read verse 23, 25. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, mm -hmm. which lives and abides forever. Mm -hmm. Because all, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Look at that. So having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. So the Bible is calling the word of God an incorruptible seed. In other words, you cannot corrupt the word of God. I, I think about what we learned earlier, the preservation of the word of God. For all those years, according to uh, theologians, for all those years that the word was written, for over 1600 years, then over the years that man has lived on earth, all these years, the word of God has been preserved. However men try to corrupt it, try to transliterate it wrongly, they try to do this, but the word of God remains outstanding. It's an incorruptible seed. And then the Bible says, this word which lives and abides forever. So the word of God is eternal. So the word is eternal and God is eternal. You see that? The word of God is eternal. But again, if you go back, the Bible says, having been born again. So the word of God is the source of salvation. Is the means through which man can be born again. So those people that we want to see them get saved, all they need to hear is the accurate presentation of the word of God, the gospel. The accurate presentation of the gospel in a simplified manner that this person can be able to understand without using terminologies that you have learned, without being so complicated, without being so high up there. You take the gospel to this person in simplicity and in accuracy of doctrine and that's all you need for someone to get saved. And now we have the assurance there because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. What an assurance. There's no time that you'll find that the word of God is not available to perform that which he sent it to, to do. There's no time that that will happen. 
Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, mm -hmm. has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Yeah. Which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So when we began, we said that all scripture is is part of who? And that's what Peter is referring to here. He's saying, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. So we are looking at the human author called Paul, writing down scriptures, but we understand that these scriptures were inspired of God. The human author is Paul. He's writing down scriptures. And these scriptures is the word of God because it's inspired of God. And remember I told you how we relate to the Bible can be an, uh, a positive influence or a source of confusion. Now look at what Peter says there. In verse 16, as also in all these episodes, speaking in them of these things, in which some, those, they are not here, Cindy, some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable and people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So you can see men who twist scripture, and you can see there are others who teach the scripture with accuracy, doctrinal accuracy and simplicity of speech. Whatever Paul wrote down is being called scripture and we saw earlier all scripture is inspired of God and therefore whatever is inspired of God is the word of God. So whatever Paul wrote is the word of God. Is the word of God. The last scripture, Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, mm -hmm. who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So look at that. Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this book of Revelation, it reveals who? The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to show his servants things which must shortly take place and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So we are seeing, you remember in our eyes we say that the theme of the Bible is the glory of God and the salvation of man. So who brings salvation to man? Jesus Christ. So this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave. So if it is the revelation of Christ Jesus that God gave, what is it? The word of God. But here the Bible says, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So he bore witness to the word of God. In other words, the revelation that was given by God about Christ Jesus, John bore witness to this and he bore witness even the way the things that God was telling him fitted together with the Old Testament scriptures, with the apostolic writings, they all fitted together and John bore witness to this as the word of God. The Bible says, bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Christ to all things that is so. Verse 3 says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the word of this prophecy and keep these things which are written in it, for the time is near. So, if you have ever read the book of uh, Revelation, the Bible calls you blessed. If you have ever read the book of Revelation, just the way Ivy has read that verse, the Bible calls her blessed. But now it says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. So, you can see the Bible referring 
to the revelation of Christ Jesus as the word of God. Then Revelation 22 verse 18, our last scripture. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If uh -huh. anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Now, do you remember somewhere we read, somewhere in the Bible, we read that you should not lie about the word of God. Who can remember where it was? Proverbs chapter 30 and verse. Go back there and read. Proverbs 30. 30 verse 5 to 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. So every word of God is pure. And the same, same God becomes a shield to those who put their trust in him. And we say that you can trust God by trusting his word. When you trust the word of God, then you have trusted God. So when they say you put your trust in God, it means you have trusted, you have believed. You are living a life that is reliant on the word that God has given you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Do not add to his words. Do not add to his word. Uh -huh. Lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Amen. Praise God. We have finished our introductory lesson. We have finished. Next time we meet, we'll be looking at the external evidence. But the external evidence just, uh, we have already looked at it, but we'll look at it again. Kidogo. Then we will go to what is called now the Bible as inspired of God. We want to get the proof of divine inspiration so that we can trust this book as the word of God. We want internal proof and external proof that this is the inspired word of God so that we can trust it as the word of God. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. We thank God yes, for sir. Pastor. Pastor, may the Lord bless you so much. One thing we must understand that the word of God is uncorruptible and since when it was established up to today, it's pure and it's holy. So it worketh in our lives as it intended. So we thank God for the pastor and we continue praying for you that God may continue to increase you in wisdom and in understanding that you may continue to edify even the body of Christ. So we want to thank God for today. We don't, we're not going to add anything on that. We know we are tired. Let us stand up and pray and then we go and take our late lunch. Gracious and loving Father, in the name of your son Jesus Christ, we give you all the glory, praise and honor. Indeed, Lord Jesus, we want to thank you even for this moment of time that, Lord, even from 9 a.m. you are here, even up to now, Lord, it is you are doing. It is you, O oh Lord, who has taken us all even through all this session. And yet, Lord, we know it is not in vain. This is the fellowship that, Lord, you would desire even for each one of us, even to be in it at each and every given time, concerning your word and concerning your precepts, O oh God. Therefore, Lord, we thank you even for today. We thank you for every knowledge that has imparted even further this, this church, O oh God, this fellowship, O oh God, this team, O oh God, this people who are here, O oh God. Teach us, O oh Lord, of your word, that, Lord, they may go and impart even further in each and every class they do. And even to the outside world, O oh God, wherever, O oh Lord, they will be, O oh God, they will be even able to minister your word, O oh Lord, effectively, O oh Lord, without even further any lingering, O oh God. Lord, we thank you for the pastor. We pray that, Lord, may you continue even to equip him, may you continue even to bless him, to uplift him both physically and spiritually, Lord. Bless his family, O oh God. And that, Lord, Father, in each and every area of need, Father, we pray that, Lord, may you even make provision. We thank you for each and every one who is here, that, Father, even as we Go to take this lunch, O oh God, Father, we pray that, Lord, may you bless it. May you sanctify it, O oh Lord, even, Father, for the nourishing of the body. As we leave this place, O oh God, Father, we pray for your love and your goodness, your protection and your peace. And that, Lord, until such a time again, that, Lord, we shall meet here, O oh God. All glory, honor, and praise shall be unto you. For this we pray, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh Lord my God, when I know some wonder, consider the words thy hands have made. 
I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe.